Mamadi Doumbouya, born on March 4, 1980, is a Guinean military officer currently serving as the interim president of Guinea since October 1, 2021. Dumbuya orchestrated a coup d'etat on September 5, 2021, which ousted the previous president, Alpha Conde. He hails from the Kankan region of Guinea and has Mandinka origins. Yet on the other side of the divide is Ibrahim Traore, the junta leader of Burkina Faso, who came into power via a coup on the 30th of September, 2022. Before assuming office, Dumbuya served as a French legionnaire, holding the rank of corporal before returning to Guinea to lead the Special Forces Group, an elite military unit established by President Alpha Condé. He received promotions to the ranks of battalion commander, lieutenant colonel, and colonel, citing his international experience gained from various training sessions in different countries. Notably, in 2018, he met Asimi Goita from Mali during a U.S. Army training session in Burkina Faso, both of whom later initiated military coups in their respective countries. Throughout his 15-year military career, Dumboya was deployed on missions to several countries, including Afghanistan, Ivory Coast, Djibouti, Central African Republic, Israel, Cyprus, the UK, and Guinea. By the way, he is married to Lauriane Darbou, an active duty member of the French national gendarmerie, and they have four children. And that singular fact is probably the reason why some, namely Treor of Burkina Faso, have come out to question where Dumbuya's loyalties are. Nevertheless, he is among the officials from Guinea threatened with sanctions by the European Union over allegations of human rights abuses. In May 2021, rumors surfaced about a possible arrest of Dumbuya while in Conakry, though no specific accusations or charges were mentioned by the government. But then, Dumbuya went on to spearhead the Guinean coup d'etat on September 5, 2021, leading to the detainment of President Alpha Condé. He declared the dissolution of the government and constitution on state television, citing the dire political situation, corruption, and non-respect of democratic principles. He justified the military's actions by quoting former Ghanaian President Jerry Rawlings, emphasizing the army's role in restoring freedom to the people. Following the coup, Dumbuya warned ministers against rebellion and announced that former President Condé would not be released but would receive health care. He dismissed concerns about potential economic sanctions by Ecoways and refused to allow Condé to leave Guinea. On October 1, 2021, Dumbuya was sworn in as interim president, pledging to reorganize the state, hold free and transparent elections, and honor national and international commitments. It was at that juncture he set in motion a three-year plan that would culminate in elections by 2024. He later met with his old military school pal, Asimi Goita of Mali, as well as Paul Kagame of Rwanda, drawing inspiration from Kagame's reforms in Rwanda. However, more recently, and in a twist that was bound to happen, Dumbuya and the National Committee of Reconciliation and Development ordered the dissolution of the interim government on February 19th, 2024. And this action has cast doubts on Guinea ever returning to civilian rule. Dumbuya has also faced criticism for threatening anti-government protesters with life imprisonment. Worse still, no one anticipated this course of action by the Guinean government, and Dumbuya himself didn't give any indication of this during his UN address in September of last year. In his words to the UN General Assembly, he articulated a defense of recent coups in Africa, framing them as endeavors by military forces to rescue their nations from the grip of leaders whose prolonged tenures and unfulfilled pledges have hampered progress. Colonel Dumbuya's remarks bluntly suggested that the West's condemnation of these coups oversimplifies the complex dynamics at play within African nations. He also mentioned the importance for global leaders to move away 
from merely denouncing the coups to delving into the underlying causes fueling such actions. Highlighting the negative nature of entrenched leadership, Colonel Dumbuya condemned those leaders who subvert democratic processes, often by manipulating constitutional frameworks to cling to power indefinitely, and he was indirectly referring to Conde. He also pointed to the prevalence of this practice across the continent, asserting that it has contributed to a cycle of stagnation and disenchantment among African populations. As a refresher, Guinea, along with several other nations in West and Central Africa, has witnessed a spate of military takeovers in recent years, reflecting a broader trend of political upheaval in the region. While these coups have elicited mixed reactions domestically and internationally, they have sparked concerns regarding the continent's stability, particularly given its growing population. Colonel Dumboya's critique even extended to external interventions in Africa's political space, rejecting attempts by Western and other developed nations to impose their influence on African affairs. This was where he then emphasized the agency and determination of African people to chart their course, independent of external pressures and agendas. However, despite Colonel Dumbuya's defense of coups as necessary interventions to address systemic challenges, doubts persist regarding their efficacy. Instances such as the proliferation of armed groups in Mali and economic setbacks in Burkina Faso following coups underscore the complexities and risks associated with military takeovers. Nigerian President Bola Tinubu, in his capacity as leader of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, echoed these concerns, emphasizing the need for holistic solutions to endemic issues rather than resorting to coups or flawed governance structures. But all of that happened late last year, and as at current press time, Guinea's military leadership has announced the dissolution of the interim government. In a video statement released on Guinean media outlets, military officials declared their intention to establish a new administration, with current cabinet directors, secretaries general, and their deputies assuming temporary responsibility until the formation of the new government. The reasons behind the dissolution remain undisclosed, raising uncertainties about its implications and the identities of key figures in the new government. We might recall that President Alpha Conde's controversial bid for a third presidential term in 2020 ignited political tensions and also triggered his ouster. Scuffles broke out once again on the streets of Guinea's capital. Conde's manipulation of the constitution to extend his tenure sparked widespread protests, resulting in fatalities and numerous arrests amid clashes between demonstrators and security forces. Since that time, Guinea's political landscape has been marred by unrest, exacerbated by the government's crackdown on opposition figures accused of inciting electoral violence. The Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, has been actively urging the military junta to expedite the transition to democratic governance, with a mutually agreed upon 24-month transition period established in October 2022. But presently, it seems the contrary is now the case. To put things in context when examining the Sahel region's countries, namely Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, it's evident that Guinea receives scant attention compared to its neighbors, despite President Dumboya's personality cult. While Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso frequently dominate discussions on regional politics, Guinea's leadership remains largely overlooked. This discrepancy in attention certainly prompts crucial inquiries into the underlying dynamics shaping whatever perceptions and responses are to be had. Several factors contribute to the disparity in attention between Guinea and its neighboring countries, including geopolitical considerations, historical contexts, and regional dynamics. 
The long and short of it is Guinea's political landscape, although characterized by similar trends in military intervention, may not pose perceived threats or challenges to Western interests to the same extent as its counterparts. Additionally, Guinea's internal dynamics and diplomatic relations likely diverge significantly from those of other countries. No doubt, exploring the distinctions between Colonel Mamadi Dumboya and other military leaders, such as Captain Traor, may serve to shed light on the factors influencing Guinea's exclusion from initiatives like the Sahel Alliance recently formed to address regional challenges. For instance, Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya has garnered media attention on only three occasions since assuming power in 2021. The first instance was his ascension to leadership following the ousting of Alpha Conde in September 2021. The second occasion was his vocal support for Mali and Burkina Faso during the initial coup in Niger, as well as his impassioned address at the 78th United Nations General Assembly. The third instance occurred with the dissolution of Guinea's government. Apart from these events, Guinea and its interim president have maintained relative stability compared to the tumultuous developments witnessed in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso under military rule. And while Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso have taken decisive measures to expel French forces from their territories, Guinea, under the leadership of Colonel Dumbuya, has not pursued a similar course of action. In a significant development in 2022, France quietly resumed military cooperation with Guinea, facilitated by Colonel Dumbuya's request for French assistance in securing Guinea's northeastern border with Mali. Unlike the anti-French sentiment prevalent in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso, Guinea's stance towards France since Colonel Dumbuya assumed power has been relatively subdued, with no explicit opposition voiced. And while the military junta in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso have taken concrete steps to wash off French influence within their respective countries, Guinea continues to sit on the fence. Colonel Dumbuya has refrained from making definitive statements indicating opposition to France, nor has he taken any drastic measures like his counterparts. This raises questions about the divergence in leadership styles between Colonel Dumbuya and his regional fellows. A crucial aspect distinguishing Colonel Dumbuya's leadership is his background as a former French legionnaire. Serving in the French Legion entails a unique military experience within the French Army, accepting foreign recruits who pledge to serve France. After a minimum service period of three years, legionnaires are eligible for French citizenship or immediate citizenship if wounded in battle under the provision of French by spilled blood. Colonel Dumbuya underwent rigorous training at France's École des Officiers de la Légion Étrangère, or Foreign Legion Officers School, and served for five years in the French Legion. It's essential to recognize that members of the French Legion are expected to maintain loyalty to France even after leaving the force, constraining Colonel Dumbuya's ability to take overtly adversarial actions against France. Then there is the issue of Colonel Dumbuya's marriage to Lauriane Darbou, who serves in the French National Gendarmerie. The French National Gendarmerie, functioning as both a law enforcement agency and a branch of the military, equally highlights the depth of Colonel Dumbuya's familial ties to France. It's reasonable to assume that his spouse's allegiance to France would influence his stance and actions concerning French relations diminishing his capacity to act against French interests, there is even speculation surrounding France's involvement in the coup that propelled Colonel Dumbuya to power. This supposedly stems from the strained relations between Guinea and France during the tenure of former President Alpha Conde. However, conclusive evidence remains elusive. Yet, Colonel Dumbuya's inclusion among the 25 Guinean officials threatened with EU sanctions for alleged human rights violations under President Condé's regime is of note. With France as a member state of the European Union, 
the threat of sanctions looms over Colonel Dumbuya, curbing his ability to take assertive measures that may antagonize European interests. Thus, Colonel Dumbuya's reluctance to level up with counterparts like Captain Treor on the international stage stems from a strategic imperative to navigate diplomatic minefields while preserving stability within Guinea. And despite General Dumbuya's aspirations for a transformative leadership akin to the likes of Captain Treor's, external pressures curtail his ability to fully embrace such a course. However, the recent dissolution of the government hints at a potential shift in his approach, possibly signaling a readiness to confront France and press Guinea's interests more assertively. And he could very well extend that same courtesy to any of his many international detractors. In short, the dissolution of the Guinean government is the first move in as many that signal it's not going to be business as usual anymore, and whether or not it is the proverbial calculated move that is bound to turn out well remains to be seen. Furthermore, recent revelations hint at tensions between Colonel Dumbuya and Captain Ibrahim Traor, possibly stemming from personal and political dynamics. The overthrow of Paul Henry Demiba by Captain Traor and other dissatisfied young soldiers on September 30th, 2022, is the bone of contention here. Colonel Dumboya's perceived grouse towards Traor may stem from his association with Paul Henry Demiba, who was deposed by Traor's faction. This personal connection, coupled with divergent political philosophies, may have strained the relationship between Colonel Dumbuya and Ibrahim Traora, contributing to their lack of communication. It's worth noting that Paul Henry Demiba, the ousted leader of Burkina Faso, who attended and graduated from the École des Officiers de la Légion étrangère, shares a significant connection with Colonel Dumbuya. Both individuals not only attended the same military school, but also did so concurrently. Given their shared educational background and the close-knit nature of military training, it's reasonable to conclude that they would have formed a bond, potentially evolving into close friends over time. Additionally, both Colonel Dumbuya and Paul Henry assumed leadership in their respective countries in 2021, further cementing their parallel paths in life. The events of September 30th, 2022, marked a pivotal turning point in their relationship when Captain Treor orchestrated a coup that ousted Paul Henry de Miba, subsequently exiling him to Togo. This act undoubtedly strained the friendship between Colonel Dumbuya and Paul Henry, as it involved the forceful removal of a close associate from power and his banishment from the country. So it is understandable why Colonel Dumbuya may be reluctant to associate with someone who deposed and exiled his friend. However, in the aftermath of assuming power, Colonel Dumbuya's diplomatic engagements have been very selective, with his primary focus centered on Mali, particularly meetings with Asimi Guo. This strategic choice aligns with their pre-existing acquaintance, established during a training session for regional special forces commanders hosted by the U.S. Army in Burkina Faso in 2018, of all places. Additionally, the apparent disregard for strengthening ties with Burkina Faso or pursuing membership in the Three Country Alliance may also stem from various other factors, including Colonel Dumbuya's discontent with Captain Treor's leadership style and external pressures, notably from France. Ultimately, Colonel Dumbuya's diplomatic engagements reflect a delicate balancing act between personal allegiances, regional dynamics, and external pressures. Certainly, his work as an increasingly isolated coup leader is cut out for him. Whatever the case, how he navigates the complexities of leadership by way of his actions going forward will serve to shape Guinea's relationships with its neighbors and global partners. And it's not just him. The evolving dynamics within the Sahel geopolitical landscape are suggestive of the complexities of regional and international diplomacy. So the real leadership challenge is how to manage external influences while pursuing the domestic objectives of the nation states in question. 
As Colonel Dumbuya and the three or so other junta leaders try to maneuver these complexities, the least we can allow them is some goodwill. But what are your opinions on the issues discussed? Feel free to leave your comments below.